Today we're going to be looking at Old Testament wisdom literature. These are the uh, five books of wisdom in your Old Testament. This is chapter 22 of Duval and Hayes Grasping God's Word. It is the last chapter in your textbook, and I hope that you have enjoyed reading this textbook. I really hope that you've learned something from diving into this book and helping and it helping you dive into the Word of God. I, uh, I really hope that we're taking these principles and applying them to our interpretations of Scripture as we try to look at what the original author meant and, uh, and what it meant for the original audience and ultimately what it means for us today. So with regards to the wisdom literature, uh, these are a particular genre in and of themselves. And a genre is just a uh, classification of where and how to classify certain pieces of literature. And so when you look at the wisdom books, we're asking here, what are these books trying to convey that unite them together in ways that other books uh, don't have? And so these books are all trying to suggest some kind of applicable truth that is based in ultimate wisdom. Uh, wisdom and logic are two different things, and wisdom and knowledge are two different things. It's been said many times before that uh, knowledge is what you do with material, and wisdom is how you put that into practice. And so the five books are Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and there is another book, the book of Psalms can go in here, uh, but Psalms is kind of its own breed, and we're not going to look at Psalms particularly. This list of wisdom literature will vary based on who you read, based on different uh, textbooks that you read. Duval and Hayes only include these four. I would include Psalms in the list. Uh, most of your books will not include Job. They'll take Job as kind of a narratival book, and uh, they'll exclude that and include Psalms. Uh, but basically, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs is going to be the base text for your wisdom literature. Now, what you may notice about these is that some of them are uh, very poetic. Others of them are narratival. Most of them are written in prose, and I think we'll talk about that later as we continue on. The purpose of the wisdom books are uh, singular in, in their overall purpose for their readers. So when we're looking at why was this particular book written, uh, what was the goal that the particular author was wanting to get across, basically one word. It's the imperative word, think. You need to think about life. You need to think about your uh, personality. You need to think about your relationship with God. You need to think about everything that goes on in the world. And one thing that makes the wisdom books so useful for today's time is that most of the time when you ask someone their opinion on something or how they view certain things, they will use the phrase, I feel. I feel. Now, that's not entirely a bad thing, uh, but I think the wisdom books challenge us to say, I think, rather than I feel. Uh, having that ability to think versus feel is very important for us. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, uh, the proverb writer here, and there's multiple proverb writers throughout the book of Proverbs, here we believe it to be Solomon, says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so that's the theological foundation of wisdom. This same phrase is found in every single wisdom book, no matter what the list of wisdom books are. Uh, this particular uh, phrase, this particular verse, comes about in Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and Job as well. So what's the purpose of wisdom books? What's the purpose of wisdom literature? Well, wisdom books build a practical theology for living faithfully every single day. The wisdom books are trying to teach us, as they try to teach their original audiences, that each aspect of our life has to be revolved in godliness. And for that to happen, we have to think about God in perhaps different terms of what we've normally thought. So for most of us, we often think about God, for example, as a benevolent God. He's a loving God. Of course, uh, from the New Testament, we know from 1 John 4 that God is love. And we see God as this gracious God and this all-forgiving God that really is challenged with the book of Job, for instance, where Job sees God as the, uh, the, the allower of evil things. We're not calling him the source of evil things, of course, but he's the allower of evil things. And what does that do to our all-loving and, and all-compassionate God that we have? And so we know, based on our lives and based on the things that we do, 
in our lives that sometimes bad things happen to good people. And the wisdom literature and wisdom books allow us to take those things and look at them objectively and say, yes, bad things happen to good people, but this is God's work in all of that. And we'll look at the book of Job a little bit later. The purpose of the wisdom books uh, is to form godly character. If we were to sum this up and wrap it all up in one particular way, it would be to form godly character. And so as uh, most people read from the wisdom literature, uh, one verse a day. In Proverbs, that's a great thing to do. Psalms is a great thing to do, but again, Psalms is kind of on its own with Duval and Hayes. But you have, with Proverbs, you can read one verse, and that one particular verse could be kind of your theme for the day. Um, I, I, I uh, am a country guy. I wear cowboy hats and big belt buckles a lot. Uh, I, I do work as an auctioneer, and I live on a farm and all of that, so I'm, I'm kind of a, a southern country cowboy kind of guy. And on one of my belt buckles, I have, uh, I think it's Proverbs 14.23, inscribed on that belt buckle, which says, uh, in, in all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. And I think that's a great verse to kind of structure my day, to be kind of the theme verse of my day, that if I want to do something, it's going to require me to have that uh, that mindset of doing work and making sure that, that I'm toiling and bringing that, that profit to myself. And so the formation of godly character, when we look at the wisdom literature, when we look at these wisdom books, that's the overall theme and the purpose that the authors had. When we look at wisdom books, it's important for us to understand the big picture behind them. For most of the Bible, Christians would look at it and say, well, the Bible says that that means it's true in every particular way. And I understand why Christians say that, and I'm not at all denying the validity of the Bible. What I am trying to suggest here is that when you look at wisdom literature, we remember that genre. So it's important for us to realize that when we're looking at wisdom literature, that there is a bigger picture here, and that wisdom literature does look at the big picture. Now, what that means for us might be a little different than what most people would say when looking at the Bible. A lot of people will look at the Bible, and I'm not at all denying this, but they'll say, you know, the, the Bible says it, and that settles it. Well, that's true in a lot of senses, especially if we look at it in context, but it is important for us to realize, too, that the, the wisdom literature, these four books, that arguably five, that we've looked at already, these present rational, ordered norms of life. So maybe not in every sense these are true, but in most normal senses they are what we'll call universal truths. So a good example of this is Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older he will not depart from it. Now that particular teaching uh, is universally true. If you train up a child to be an adult, to be a good person, to love the Lord, and to be a, a good follower after the Lord, and, and to be just a, an upstanding person in the community, generally that child will follow in those steps. But you and I all know uh, of children who have been raised up by godly parents, and uh, perhaps you deal with this in your family, unfortunately, but uh, maybe they've been raised up by godly parents, and ultimately they leave and uh, engage in a life full of debauchery, and um, maybe they get into things like drugs and uh, sexual promiscuity and things like that. You know, I think about the prodigal son in Luke's gospel that Jesus talks about there. and you know, He had been raised up the same as his other brothers. He had been raised up by a great father and by uh, a good, uh, godly individual, but ultimately he, uh, he leaves everything to, to spend his inheritance on reckless living, and, uh, and what a tragedy. In that particular sense, Proverbs 22, 6 doesn't fit, but that also ignores the normative parts of life. So these are, these are normal, these are uh, not necessarily true in every single sense, but in most normal senses, they are true. So when we come to the book of Job, uh, Job has long been a misunderstood book, unfortunately, because we look at Job and we say, well, God is the source of suffering. And we forget that the book is teaching us how to suffer righteously, how to, how to have that righteous suffering that we might even have to deal with 
even today. And so when you look at the book of Job, you see that tragedy strikes even the wise and the righteous. And that's exactly who Job is. Job is a wise man. He's a righteous man. He's a godly man. And that's exactly why Satan singles him out in chapter 1. That uh, Job is, is, there's none like him. He is a great godly man. He's blameless and, and he's favored by God. There's none like him in all the earth. And so Satan singles him out and targets him for that very reason. And, and so it doesn't necessarily matter how good or how bad of a person you are. Bad things and tragedy will happen to you. In tragedy, we need to rely on God, our Creator, because God is ultimately the source who will get us through all of these things. And I want us to know through our study of Job that it's okay to question God. And it's okay to ask God certain questions as long as we're okay with His answers. In the book of Job, Job angrily calls out to God. Job is uh, he's frustrated with God, he's angry with God, and he asks God, why did you do this? Why did you make all this happen? And ultimately, in the last few chapters, God answers Job. And God ultimately doesn't really give him an answer to his questions, but God says, were you there when I created the world? Were you there when I ordered every single thing? Were you there when I, when I made life as it is? So ultimately, God says, you can question me, but the answer is, I am God, and I will do what I want. And of course, what God wants at the end of the book of Job is to see Job come out of this trial and to bless Job because of his allegiance and diligence in those trials as well. Now, when we move to Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes has often been called the most depressing book of the Bible. And there's a lot of truth in that. Ecclesiastes is a very depressing book. If we take Solomon to be the author or co-author of several of these uh, wisdom literature books, uh, most of Proverbs was written by Solomon, we believe, Ecclesiastes, and of course the Song of Songs. It seems that the Song of Solomon was written first by Solomon, that this is when he's young and he has kind of those youthful passions, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but then in Proverbs, he's kind of leveled out, but it seems like he has a young child that he's trying to teach and train up in these particular ways. But then ultimately we get to Ecclesiastes, and this seems to be a reflection of Solomon at the end of his life, reflecting back on the rest of his life. And if we're familiar with passages uh, like uh, Kings and so on, where you get a, an account of the life of Solomon, it's so interesting that you know Solomon was married to a, a lot of these uh, foreign women. He had all kinds of possessions, so much so, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and 2 tells us about those possessions, but so much so that no one else could even fathom having such an amount of possessions. And uh, Solomon says, it's absolutely worthless. Everything is absolutely worthless. So it, it is a depressing book, but it shows us that there is an intellectual search for meaning in life. And so it kind of goes back to what we talked about with I think versus I feel. Uh, we don't need to necessarily say, I feel X, Y, and Z about so-and-so topic. We need to be logical. We need to ask questions. We need to think about life. Numerous exceptions to the ordered rational universe are revealed in the book of Ecclesiastes. So what we might think or we might perceive as true, for example, there is the perception even today that having a lot of money will make one happy. And uh, that is an exception. You know, the, the ordered rational universe tells us that, but that completely goes out the door with Ecclesiastes, and I would suggest elsewhere in the Bible as well. Ultimately, Ecclesiastes teaches us that meaning in life is only found through a relationship with God. That's what we want. That's what Solomon ultimately finds out in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, which we'll get to when we look and take that interpretive journey with Ecclesiastes. When we get to the Song of Songs, uh, this is a, a controversial book in how we teach it. And uh, a lot of church fathers would even suggest that after one has memorized every single book of the Bible, then that person can begin a study of Song of Songs. Uh, this is because of its sexual nature. It is very sexual. Um, I disagree with a lot of church people, if you will who call the Song of Songs biblical pornography. Uh, I don't like that term, and I hope that you don't either. And I hope that you'll never use that term in relation to a book of God's Word. 
But the Song of Songs is a very sexual book, and it celebrates sex within the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. And so the Song of Songs celebrates the wild, irrational, mushy, and corny aspects of true love. And so whereas Ecclesiastes and Proverbs takes a very logical and structured approach, Song of Songs is almost the total opposite. Uh, one reason why I think Solomon wrote this at the beginning of his uh, kingship as a young man is because of this uh, wild and irrational thought process. You're feeling those passions and you're conveying those passions out. Uh, whether this song was written for Solomon or by Solomon, there's a discrepancy there in the Hebrew text, but wh whichever one that is, it really doesn't matter. It communicates to us that sexuality is a good and godly thing within its proper confines. Now, a lot of wisdom literature is written poetically. A lot of it's written in prose as well. Uh, not, not a lot is written in narrative, though we could argue that Job is a narrative. But when we look at wisdom literature as poetry, we need to understand what's called parallelism. And this occurs in both prose and poetry as well. But it's basically saying the same thing twice in another way. And so a great example of this is Job chapter 6 and verse 2. If only my anguish could be weighed, and all my misery be placed on scales. So what we see here is uh, Job is saying the exact same thing two different ways. And, and that's very common in poetry. So this parallelism, this it, it structures Hebrew poetry where one thing is said the same way twice. So keep that in mind. And when you're reading uh, the, the poet, poetry and you're reading the wisdom literature, I know some of you, are doing your uh, interpretive papers on Psalms, uh, on a section of Psalms, and uh, whatever chapter that may be is up to you. I want to encourage you, look for parallelism. Look for where the author has said the same thing twice in different ways. Wisdom literature also relies on figurative imagery to communicate its message. Uh, this is a very poetic thing. We do the same thing today. Uh, you can remember being in, in high school and maybe even middle school and you'll read something out of Shakespeare, and they'll say, the sky is blue. You know, and, uh, you're like, the sky is blue. Okay, what does that mean? It means you go outside, the color of the sky is blue. And then your teacher says, no, uh, it means that Shakespeare was sad the day that he wrote this play. Um, okay, that's taking imagery and applying it to literature. And so the Song of Songs is, is the master of this. We read it several times, and one great example is in the first chapter in the 10th verse. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with a string of jewels. Well, that's very uh, imagery related. When we read this, we see the picture of this woman who is decorated with fine jewelry. And uh, that, that's certainly a depiction that the author wants us to have in our mind's eye. Further in the Song of Songs, we'll read things like, uh, your neck is, is the Tower of David, or your neck is like the Tower of David. Probably not flattering in our world today, but in their world it was very flattering and it was a great way to describe beauty. And so that imagery and that figurative language we need to really pay attention to. Don't take things uh, verbatim literally with wisdom literature, with poetry. We have to interpret it and that's our job and what we're trying to do with this particular class. So as we try to grasp the meaning of wisdom books, let's start with Proverbs. Proverbs helps us to always remember that it well it helps to always remember that individual proverbs reflect general nuggets of wisdom and not universal truths. Now we've already talked about this uh, Proverbs twenty two six and others uh, that it's generally true but not completely true in every single sense. That does not deny Scripture's authority. It doesn't deny Scripture's inerrancy. What it tells us is that the proverb writer was writing a universal truth that is uh, loosely based on the uh, experiences and context of most people. Another example, like Proverbs 22.6, is Proverbs 10.4. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. Uh, that kind of goes back to Proverbs 14.23 that I have inscribed on my belt buckle that I wear uh, most of the time. Uh, is it 100% true, though, that every person who does not work laboriously will be poor? No, I don't think so. I mean, think about the great CEOs and uh, 
people like uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, the CEO of Amazon, whatever his name is, and uh, Bill Gates and, and all those other guys, they're not really doing labor-intensive jobs. They're sitting at a desk, and uh, but they're the most wealthy people in, in the world. And uh, so does Proverbs 10.4 not apply to them? And no, it does apply to them. But hard work and, and uh, motivation and, and striving for things that you want and striving for success, that's a universal truth. And if you don't do that, you're not going to get the reward. You're not going to reap the reward of that. Uh, so we have to remember the context in which this is written. This is written to an agrarian society, which we'll look at a little bit later. And if you wanted to make it in the world, if you wanted to be rich, you had to get out there and work with your hands and be involved in agriculture, just something you had to do. So we want to understand Proverbs. We're going to take this through our interpretive journey with uh, all the steps, all five steps. And the first is to grasp the text in their town. So what did it mean to them? We want to, first of all, explore the literary context. And so some Proverbs, as they're written in chapter and verse divisions in our Bible, some of them stand alone. Some of them are connected to others. Uh, sometimes wisdom is referred to as a woman, and foolishness is referred to as a woman as well, as a prostitute in the first few chapters of the uh, book of Proverbs. And so we want to explore those literary contexts and that imagery. We want to note the structure and basic units of the book. Uh, some, the first part of Proverbs is written as if from a father to his son. At the end, you have the words of kings. You have the model woman in Proverbs chapter 31. And so we have to explore that literary context. Uh, what is being communicated with this particular text? Step number two, we measure the width of the river to cross. And so what's the difference between our world and their world? Well, two main things that we need to take into account. The first is to be uh, noteful of the agrarian context. This means agriculture was the main context of their world. Agriculture is so very important in our world today, we wouldn't be alive without it, but it's not the main focal point of our world. Uh, I would argue today that technology and the internet and things like that uh, in postmodern society, that's the driving force in our world today. In their world, agriculture was the driving force. So when you come to Proverbs chapter 31 and you see that this woman, this model woman, went out and bought a vineyard, well, that should tell us something. That should really make these uh, alarms go off in our head that a woman, nonetheless, was able to buy a piece of land to use for an agricultural purpose to make money in that particular context, in that particular setting. That's very important for us. Also, we need to note the reference to kings. We don't live in a monarchy today that uh, is separated. There are monarchies in the world today, but we don't live in one here in America. And so, uh, the, the, the use and the reference to kings, we also need to go back to books like First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, and understand how kings were used and the wise kings and foolish kings that were mentioned in those particular books as we look at the book of Proverbs. As we try to cross the principalizing bridge, what does that do for us? What's the general principle that we bring out? Uh, well, typically, the proverb is already a general principle. Uh, this is why we call them proverbs. A proverb is a general principle and a rule of thumb, if you will, that we follow. And so you can take one of those verses and take it completely out and uh, not look at the verse before or the verse behind. And usually, you can gain meaning from that even still. And so, uh, again, for the thousandth time, if we've, said, if we've said it once, we've said it a hundred times here, these are not universal promises. These are not universal truths. But we do have to take them and uh, look at that theological principle as we try to move on. So what's the theological principle of Proverbs 22, 6? Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. The, the theological principle there is not that the child will always stay with you and stay godly if you raise them in that way. The theological principle is for us as parents. Our job is to train up our children in this particular way so that when they're older, Lord willing, and uh, hopefully they will go on and do the same. Step number four, consult the biblical map. So many themes of Proverbs are affirmed in the New Testament. Um, the theme of hard work, the theme of obedience, the theme of listening to your parents, 
Um, that theme is just completely given in the New Testament time and time again. However, there are certain things that I'm not going to say disagree, but the theme is different based on context. And so the theme of wealth, for example, as a blessing from God, it, it does undergo certain alteration in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21, that's where Jesus says, Don't store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where your treasure is, or your heart will be also. It, it seems there that Jesus is telling us in the Sermon on the Mount not to have a materialistic worldview. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, of course we know uh, this particular verse because it was one that you were supposed to explore in your homework. And uh, th this particular verse says, love money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? Uh, and so as we explore these verses, we understand that having a love for money and putting money as an idol above God is certainly wrong. And that we're doing that, we're living a materialistic lifestyle when we do that, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. But the fact remains that if we work and if we strive for those things, that God will bless his people. And God will give us, as Jesus says in the model prayer of Matthew chapter 6, give us this day our daily bread. God will take care of us for today, the things of today. And so you can blend those together. And uh, is it necessary to do that as we try to interpret these passages? The last step is to grasp the text in our town. In other words, what does this text mean for me? We have to catch the big picture of what the text tells us to be. So when we read Proverbs, whether we're reading one particular verse or reading a whole paragraph or a whole chapter or the whole book, we're asking the question, what does the author want me to be based on what I've read? Ultimately, I think for Proverbs, the author and authors want us to be followers of God. They want us to be wise. They want us to be logical. They want us to grasp knowledge. And they want us to be smart with our decisions in a godly way. Well, now let's look at the book of Job. Job is obviously going to be different from the book of Proverbs in many different ways. Uh, for Job, we have to always remember to situate smaller passages into the grand context of the complete story. Job is not a small book, and so when we study the book of Job, it's very easy for us to uh, take certain things out of context. And I want to give you an example of that. Excuse me, I left my Bible uh, over here on the table. But in Job chapter 36, in Job chapter 36... We read this. Indeed, God is mighty. This is verse 5. Indeed, God is mighty, and he does not despise people. He is mighty and firm in his intent. He does not allow the wicked to live, but he gives justice to the poor. Now, that sounds like a godly principle, doesn't it? That God, uh, that God is, is mighty. He doesn't despise anyone. That he's going to allow the wicked to fall, and he's going to lift up the righteous. Uh, that's a very common theme in the book of of Psalms and elsewhere. But when you look at chapter 36, this is Elihu speaking. Not Job and not God. Elihu is the one speaking. And so what does that mean? Well, the words of Elihu are condemned in the book of Job. He might be saying things that are good and saying things that are true, but we have to remember it's him who's speaking and that this fits in his uh, dissertation in his discourse to Job, who is ultimately going to turn back and talk about all the problems with these things. Okay? So we have to remember who's speaking in this. Take a small story, apply it to the larger context. Remember who the speaker is in the context. As we break down the book of Job, we can do that with the beginning, Job chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 10, where Satan comes to God. God allows Satan to afflict Job, and Job is afflicted in losing all of his things, uh, including his health. Oh, the only thing that Job doesn't lose here is his life. In Job chapter 2 uh, through chapter 37, verse 24, Job and his friends have conversations. So his, uh, his friends come to him, and they sit down, and they don't say anything for a long period of time, and ultimately they open their mouths and start talking, and that's when everything goes downhill, because what they're saying is, uh, is just absolutely wrong. So they unsuccessfully search for a rational answer to the reason for Job's affliction. And I think the key word here is unsuccessfully. They're not able to come up with it. In chapter 38, verse 1 to chapter 42 and verse 6, God responds to Job. God answers Job's accusations. Remember we mentioned earlier that when Job talks to God, he's asking God and accusing God, and he's angry with God, and God is going to 
answer his accusations. And that's okay. We can be angry with God. We can ask God certain things. God, why is this happening to me? We have to be okay with the answer that God gives as well. And then the last part of chapter 42, verse 7 through 17, Job's friends are rebuked, and Job is ultimately restored. Now, Job doesn't get everything back that he had originally, but uh, God does take care of Job and rewards him for his faithfulness. And so we want to take the interpretive journey again with this particular book. Step number one, we grasp the text in their town. First of all, we have to identify the literary context. Job is narrative, Job is poetry, Job is prose, and Job is wisdom literature. So those four things go into our interpretation of the book of Job. When you're looking at Job, there, it takes us a long time to see the central focal point. The central focal point doesn't come until chapter 38 uh, through chapter 42. But the rest of the book is necessary for us to get there. So it's a long journey, but the central lessons are in that particular section. Also, even though in chapter 36, for example, as we just read from, Job's friends may say things that sound really good, but they're negative characters. They're not the enemy, they're not the, the antagonist in the story, but they're negative characters. And we don't need to be like them. That's the point. We need to be more like Job, willing to suffer in uh, our godliness than be like these, these friends who say, look, man, you must have done something wrong or else you wouldn't have this happening to you. Step number two, measure the width of the river to cross. All right, so we measure the width of this river. What's the difference between us and them? Uh, well, in their world, they assume that all of tragedy is connected to God or demonic forces. Some, somehow, some supernatural being caused these bad things to happen, and it was caused because of something that you did. That was their worldview. Our worldview is very different. We split evil into three main categories. There may be others, but these are the three that I came up with. Uh, the first is natural evil. So a tornado comes through, wipes out everything, people die. That's natural evil. Number two is moral evil. This is when uh, someone decides to be, become a serial killer. You know, that, that, that sense of morality or lack thereof dictates the evil that someone does. And then there's spiritual evil. You know, we're told in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, that we are at war spiritually, that uh, we fight this, uh, this enemy, this invisible enemy who is Satan and, and demons and, and things like that. We fight the powers of the earth. Uh, this is why we put on the whole armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6, so that we can be protected against those. We cross the principalizing bridge now, step number three. Uh, I would argue that the that the river is actually pretty narrow and shallow, and so the principles for us are fairly straightforward. So long as we remember to take those principles from where the book offers the principles. And so the book offers the principles at the end. We don't want to take our principles from Job's friends or from the words of Satan, of course, or anything like that. And so principles are there. They're pretty straightforward. We just need to be wise enough to understand where they are. Step number four. We consult our biblical map. As we look from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the book of Job, uh, the New Testament actually does not repeat the picture of peace and prosperity as a result of righteous living. And this is what Job's friends struggled with. They thought that if you live righteously, you, then you'll have everything. It'll, you'll be peace and prosperous and, and all of those things. You'll just have the greatest life as long as you do good things. Uh, Job obviously shows us that's a very different picture. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12 says this, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So I desire to live godly in Christ. I hope you do as well. And if that's the case, then we will be persecuted for our cause. It's a promise. It's a, it's a universal truth that Paul gives Timothy there at the end of Paul's life as he's writing this from prison in Rome, we believe. So, the New Testament does not tell us this uh, prosperity gospel that's so often been preached. You know, if you if you just have a, a spirit of love and you, you love everyone and you do good things, good things will happen to you. That message is preached today by a lot of preachers, uh, and I would argue the Bible tells us that that's flat wrong. As we consult our uh, biblical map, we must also remember that suffering, part of living. 
Bad things happen to good people. It's just a fact of life. And uh, I, I would argue, of course, we're getting into a philosophical discussion here, but I would argue that without the bad, how would we know the good? Uh, without bad in this life, without things like pain and sorrow and suffering, how would we have the peace and joy of, of uh, being with God forever to look forward to? I, I don't think that we would. I think philosophically you have to have those things in order to have the good. In order for there to be good, bad must also exist. So suffering is just part of our living. And suffering can be used to glorify God. Job uses his suffering to glorify God. And uh, we can as well. Paul uses his suffering to glorify God. Even Jesus, as he's hanging there on the cross, he uses his suffering as the greatest glorification of God as well. Our last step is to uh, make application for ourselves, to grasp the text in our own town. Uh, our focus in grief should not be on why, but rather on God and his character. So when we're feeling this grief, and, and I don't mean the grief of you know, just losing a loved one or whatever, but when we think, why, why are all these bad things happening to me? We need to remember that God is good, that God is loving, and that God will ultimately see us through. I know it's very difficult for us to, to understand that in the middle of our suffering, but it's something that, as a Christian, needs to be on the forefront of our minds. But we should also be sympathetic with those who experience tragedy. We need to be willing to... Uh, one good thing that Job's friends do in this story is they do go to him in his suffering. And they sit there with him. It's either for five days or seven days. I, I don't remember how many days transpire, but uh, they sit there for a period of days, and they don't say anything. They just sit there with Job for a period of days. What Job needed there was their presence, not their advice or lack thereof. And it's easy for us when we see someone suffering to go to someone and start talking to them about this, that, and the other, and what God's will is, and all of that, uh, sometimes it's best just to keep our mouth shut. So we need to be sympathetic with those who experience tragedy. Let's move on now to the book of Ecclesiastes. We want to always remember to interpret passages in light of the entire book, an ultimate answer, which is found at the end of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Very easy to remember. 12, 13, 14. Uh, chapter 12, verse 13, and verse, verse 14. So at the very end, uh, the Ecclesiastes writer, who we believe to be Solomon, says this, at the end of all things, the matter is this, to, uh, to, to seek God and to love God, and ultimately, at the end of time, everything is going to be brought before him anyways. Okay, I'm paraphrasing there a lot. Uh, we'll see this, the, the exact verse at the end, but paraphrases never hurt anybody, I don't guess. When we start reading the, the book of Ecclesiastes, one word comes up over and over and over again. And part of our interpretive journey is picking up on these words that are repeated over and over and over again. And I don't know if any of you are doing your uh, interpretation project on Ecclesiastes, but if you are, here's a freebie. That's the word hevel or hevel, depending on how you want to pronounce that in Hebrew. And I know most of you probably, if not all of you, probably can't read the Hebrew that's down here. I want to read it for you. And I want you to hear the words that come up over and over and over again, okay? The word hevel means vanity or emptiness. Uh, Hebrew likes to talk in word pictures, and uh, it it's, means literally trying to catch the wind, something that is impossible. You just can't do it. it it's emptiness. It's vanity. And so the, a good definition is this. Things that look as if they have substance, but in reality, they do not. Uh, and so it doesn't take us very long in reading Ecclesiastes to see this word and to see the ultimate point of the book. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 2. Hevel havalim. Amar, Kohelet, Hevel, Havelim, Hakol, Havel. So maybe you caught that. Uh, how many times do we have the word Havel come up? Uh, over and over and over again. And then the word Havalim is the plural form of the word Havel. So you have vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Or if we want to translate it, emptiness of emptiness, says the preacher. Everything is empty. You see that word come up over and over and over again. And that's the worldview that the Ecclesiastes writer, uh, Kohelet, the preacher, has of this particular uh, world. And so as we try to grasp the text in their town, 
it's very difficult with this uh, kind of depressing language. And Ecclesiastes has long been called one of the most depressing books in the Bible. But the, the meaning for them is that apart from God, life is absolutely meaningless. So if you don't have God in your life, life is absolutely meaningless. It's all going away. It's all, it's all vanity. It's all emptiness. Uh, and the Ecclesiastes writer, I think, would tell us that wisdom is not bad, but it doesn't provide ultimate meaning in life. And, and you know, there are a lot of people who say that uh, wisdom and knowledge and the search for knowledge and the search for truth and all that, that's the meaning of life. Uh, ultimately, God is the author of all of those. And if we don't see God as the author of all of those, we've really missed the point. And so life, therefore, is not a puzzle to be completely understood, but a gift to be enjoyed. We have life as a gift from God, and that's what the Ecclesiastes writer is trying to get apart or to get across to us. So we need to measure the width of the river to cross. What's the differences? Uh, well, we, we have a limited, uh, they have, excuse me, a limited understanding of death. And so in this world, there really is no concept of the afterlife. In the Old Testament, we read of Sheol, which is the realm of the dead. If you've seen the Disney movie Hercules, you know, the Hades is Lord of the Dead. Uh, and in the, that movie, it's a very great and, and accurate depiction of what ancient afterlife would have been thought of, kind of that swirling and, and gloom and doom and all of that. That was their understanding of the afterlife. So for them, there is no really split heaven and hell. For us as Christians, having been revealed in, in Jesus, there is ultimately the reward or the punishment, heaven or hell, of being with God for all eternity or being separated from God for all eternity. And so that is a, a pretty wide river for us to cross, and we need to take that into consideration as we uh, read this book. What's the ultimate principle here? What's the theological principle that we're trying to get across? Um, due to the narrow river, most principles are similar to the statements listed in step number one. And so go back to step number one, review that with Ecclesiastes, that'll tell you the theological principles. Uh, these theological principles are basically that without God, life is absolutely meaningless. And uh, you see that with step one, you see that here, and you see that in the New Testament as well, which is our next step, to look at the biblical map, to look at the New Testament, and see what our relationship with God is. The New Testament stresses that our relationship with God is ultimately for Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, they didn't have Jesus. New Testament, Jesus comes. Jesus is our gateway to the Lord. Uh, it, Jesus even says, no one comes to the Father except by me in John 14, 1 through 6. And so uh, that's very important. I would also mention Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. I cut out a lot of the verse here just because it wouldn't fit on the PowerPoint. But Paul writes, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. And so that search for wisdom, that search for meaning and knowledge and all that, philosophy is a compound word in Greek. It's a compound of phileo and sophia. Phileo means I love. And Sophia means wisdom. So if your name is Sophia, your name means wisdom. Beautiful name. Uh, but So philosophy is the love of wisdom, right? Well, this type of philosophy is not saying that philosophy is bad. It's saying that when you put your love solely in the, in the struggle of grasping for wisdom from an earthly perspective, where logic is everything, where, where logic rules everything, you've missed the point. Because God is the author of that. And we need to understand that in order to have that relationship with him. Lastly, we grasp the text in our town, of course. Uh, we remember apart from a relationship with Jesus Christ, life is ultimately meaningless. And so uh, maybe you're, you're sitting there thinking about your relationship with Jesus right now. And uh, you're, you're thinking that I don't have that relationship with Jesus. And, and if you don't, I hope that you'll think about this book and maybe you'll read this book and be convicted of that and say, yes. Uh, I need a relationship with Jesus in order for my life to have meaning. I hope that you'll do that. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Again, I, I mentioned it earlier as a paraphrase, as my own paraphrase, but here we have it in front of us. The end of the matter, all, when all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment whether uh, with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And so even then, the author of Kohelet, the author of Ecclesiastes, knew that we would have to stand before God, give an account of all the good and all the evil that we've done. Fortunately for those of us who are Christians, we can plead the blood of Jesus, right? Uh, 
we can we're, we're blood washed. God does not see the sinner that stands before Him. God sees the Savior, Jesus Christ. But I'll stop preaching and get back to our discussion of wisdom literature here. Last book for us today is the Song of Songs. And uh, a lot of people get uncomfortable talking about the Song of Songs. We're going to talk a little bit about that here. Uh, I just want you to know that it's in the Bible, and what's in the Bible is worthy of, of reading and studying. And so I hope that you will take the time to do that diligently. The Song of Songs is a collection of love poems between a young man and a young woman. Uh, maybe it's written by Solomon. Maybe it's written for Solomon. Again, we noted that earlier as we uh, talked about this particular book. Uh, regardless, it, it's about sexual relationship within the confines of marriage and the passion that you have before marriage for your for your future spouse and within the confines of marriage now that those things can be consummated as well. Uh, one of the great things I love about Song of Songs is the, the verse over and over and over again where the, the daughters of Jerusalem sing this particular line and they say, don't awaken love until it pleases. Now, there's a time, uh, as a, the Ecclesiastes writer would also say there's time for everything. There's a time for us to engage in sexual activity within the confines of marriage and a time for us not to. Those passions that burn within us are uh, something to be celebrated, I think, uh, the, the author of Song of Songs would say, uh, that it's not wrong to have that passion for your beloved, as uh, chapter 1 and 2 and, and onward would call these particular relationships. The book of Song of Songs can be broken down in this way, chapter 1 through chapter 3, verse 5. You have the courtship, uh, these two people uh, basically dating, uh, courting one another, whatever word you want to use there. And then in chapter 3 through chapter 5, you have the wedding, uh, them coming together. And then in chapter 5 through chapter 8, you have their continual life of love and engaging in the same passion that they had in their courtship. Uh, I do a lot of premarital counseling here at the, the Salem Church of Christ in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And that's one thing that I try to stress to those young couples who are getting married is that the same passion you have now should be there when you're married. And it should never decrease. There will be times where it does seem like it's decreasing, but never stop dating your spouse is what I try to tell them. And I go to Song of Songs to prove this point. So let's take the interpretive journey one more time. Uh, we grasp the text in their town. This text was likely read or sung at weddings in the ancient world. That's what it was probably used for, to celebrate that love. And we have to remember that this is ultimately a conversation between a husband and wife. And so we can't go to Song of Songs and, and argue that this is uh, pro-premarital sex or it's against sexual relationships within the confines of marriage or whatever. We also don't need to read it allegorically, which is what the early church tried to do. They tried to look at this as a... Uh, as an allegory between Jesus and the church uh, instead of a relationship between a man and a woman. We don't want to do that. We want to take it for what it says and let that be that. Step number two, measure the width of the river across. Now, this is a pretty wide river. Uh, our worlds are very different. If I was to say to my wife some of the things that are mentioned in Song of Songs, I would either be slapped or I'd be sleeping on the couch. Uh, <laughs> so most of the imagery does it communicate to the modern reader? Now, uh, like we mentioned earlier about the, the your neck is a tower like the Tower of David. Your teeth are like goats. Um, you smell like pomegranates. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And uh, when you see it in their world, it's, it's actually very sexual, uh, very vivid sexually. And uh, we want to remember that as we study because our worlds are different. So, we have to ask the question, would this be flattering in their world, and what does it mean for us in our world? Uh, so, for example, uh, Psalm chapter 4, and verse 4, Your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows of stone. On it hangs a thousand shields, and all of them shields of warriors. Again, if I wrote that in an anniversary card, uh, I don't know when you'll be watching this, but at the time of the recording, my anniversary with my wife was yesterday, uh, November 3rd. So, if I would have wrote this, in her anniversary card, would not have been a happy anniversary, right? Because we perceive things differently. Uh, love and imagery is very different now. So we need to remember that the descriptive terms that they use and the descriptive terms that we use are ultimately going to be different. What's the theological principle? What's the main theme that we can get from this that we can use in our everyday lives? Well, I think it's very simple. People should seek a godly relationship and should be madly in love 
with his or her spouse and should express this love in strong emotional terms. So I don't know the demographics of who all is in this class. I don't know if there are those of you who are married, if you're dating, if you're single, divorced, whatever. I don't know. But if you're in a relationship, first of all, make it a godly relationship. That's the thing. Make it a godly relationship. God loves marriage. Genesis 2.24. It is the only relationship in all of the world that is God-sanctioned. Okay? So make it a godly relationship. Have a love and desire for your spouse. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, keep it appropriate in certain contexts. Uh, you know, don't don't be uh, playing tonsil hockey in the middle of a group of people. But uh, you know, have have affection for your spouse and and uh, show that love to your spouse. Uh, there is a book uh, by uh, uh, Gary Chapman called The Five Love Languages. If you haven't read that, you need to. All five of those love languages tell you how to communicate love to your spouse. It's very important for marriage and for relationships. And they need to be expressed, and and there shouldn't be any shame in doing that. Now, what does the New Testament say about this? Well, the New Testament obviously affirms this principle. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and following to verse 33, the Bible tells wives to submit to your husband. That's not a derogatory term, but we're not studying Ephesians, so I don't have time to go into it now. Uh, and, And for husbands to love their wives. And so you have that husband-wife relationship where you're solely devoted to one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is uh, basically the New Testament Song of Solomon. It talks about uh, how to have that sexual relationship within marriage that, gentlemen, you own your wife's body and she owns your body. You're not your own. You belong to one another in every sense of the term. And uh, that the conjugal rights that come with that uh, are, are there in the marriage relationship. And so those are two of, of many passages that talk about that, uh, that affirm that theological principle. So what does it mean for us? Uh, I think it's very simple when it all gets boiled down, that, that married couples can apply it verbally, that we can apply the Song of Songs verbally uh, in expressing our love to our spouses with romantic gestures. Tell If you're married or if you're dating or whatever, if you're gay, whatever your, your situation Uh, Tell that person that you love them, show them that you love them, and have a godly relationship. Remember, uh, ungodly relationships God obviously does not approve of. But godly relationships are there uh, for us to enjoy. So as we think about the wisdom literature, uh, to sum it all up in three main things, I want you to retain these three things so that we can understand wisdom literature better. The first is this. Wisdom literature presents universal truth. But it's not true in every sense, and it won't be true in every sense, but it is universally true. Number two, wisdom literature is often poetic. And so as poetry, we need to be familiar with parallelism, the use of imagery, um, and uh, other poetic ways of writing. Uh, If you include the Psalms in here, maybe understanding the use of acrostics in uh, poetic structure, uh, which we didn't talk about Psalms. I think Duval and Hayes put that as as its own category, but... uh, we, we need to remember that wisdom literature can be poetic, narratival, prose, whatever. But understand the literary context of the book that you're studying. And number three, I think this is most important. Wisdom literature must be interpreted in terms of history, genre, and literary structure. So history, we want to look at what the history of their world was so that we can bring it into our world. Unless we understand their world, we're never going to understand the text in our world. It's just a matter of fact. Genre, is this a a narrative with Job? Uh, Who's speaking here? Is it conversation? Is Is it poetry? Is it prose? What genre does it fall under? And I understand wisdom literature is a genre within itself, but that genre can be subdivided again into other categories. And it's literary structure. So as we follow the literary structure here, for example, uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Right? That literary structure shows us uh, a, a rhythm and a flow that continues to trickle down where vanity is going to be the key theme in that letter. So I hope that you've gained something from today's class. Uh, I really hope that you've gained something from reading Duval and Hayes and that this has helped you study the Bible more and better. And uh, I look forward to uh, 
uh, looking at more of your uh, presentations, your projects, your homework. Uh, I, I hope that something that we're doing is helping here. And I hope that as you look at wisdom literature, you will remember the one word that wisdom literature is concerned with. That's the word think. Let's learn how to think and think objectively. Uh, I hope that you have a great rest of your day. God bless you. And I'll be praying for you. Look forward to seeing your work. Bye-bye.